I'll start by trying to describe what edema is. It is swelling of the body or part of the body as a result of an increase in the amount of interstitial fluid. To understand how edema is formed, we have to go back to our physiology days and try to remember the forces that act on the capillary wall affecting movement of fluid across it, the so-called Stirling forces. On the arterial end, the hydrostatic pressure is higher than the oncotic pressure, that is the uh, osmotic pressure of plasma proteins. Now that will drive fluid from the inside of the capillary to the outside. As the blood moves from the arterial side to the venous side, the hydrostatic pressure gradually decreases, while the oncotic pressure gradually increases as a result of fluid loss. This will cause fluid to go back from the outside of the capillary to the inside. Besides this, fluid from the interstitial space also move through the lymphatics to the lymphatic duct and back to the circulation. Now this, this set of forces will keep the volume of the interstitial fluid within normal limits and constant. Edema is formed when these fluid, these forces are disturbed in a way that promote movement of fluid from the inside of the capillary to the outside. Now this occurs when the hydrostatic pressure increases as a result of impairment of venous drainage, which results from a local cause like uh, venous uh, thrombosis or as a result of a general cause like congestive heart failure. It also occurs when the oncotic pressure decreases as a result of a decrease in the concentration of plasma protein, which occurs in renal disease, hepatic disease, malnutrition, malabsorption, and so on. Edema can also occur when the permeability of the capillary wall increases as a result of inflammation. This causes protein to ooze from the inside of the capillary to the outside, causing a decrease in the concentration inside and an increase of the concentration outside. Edema can also occur when the lymphatics are blocked as a result of some disease in the area affecting the lymphatics. This cannot be the whole story. After all, a patient with generalized edema can put on several or many liters in weight. This cannot be the result of simple shift of fluid from the inside of the capillaries to the outside. After all, the whole volume of plasma is not more than 3 liters. So, another mechanism must be involved. That mechanism is this. A reduction in blood volume, mainly or specifically the arterial blood volume, will result in a stimulation of the suprarenal to produce more aldosterone, that is, a state of hyperaldosteronism, which is secondary hyperaldosteronism. Now that will make the kidney retain sodium and water in an attempt to correct the decreased blood volume. Now that retained sodium and water cannot stay inside the circulatory system because of the disturbance mentioned earlier and it oozes out producing an increase in the edema. The continued reduced blood volume will result in a continuous stimulation of the suprarenal and a persistent state of secondary hyperaldosteronism. And so the edema gradually increases with time. Edema can be localized due to a local pathology causing a disturbance of the forces described earlier and causing a local swelling, or it can be generalized caused by a systemic cause and accompanied by a state of secondary hyperaldosteronism and a general retention of sodium and water. Localized edema can be the result of inflammation, which causes an increase in the permeability of the capillary membrane, or due to venous 
drainage obstruction as occurs in venous thrombosis or due to lymphatic blockage. Generalized edema can be the result of heart failure causing an increase in the venous pressure generally on all over the body or as a result of kidney or liver disease causing hypoproteinemia and retention of sodium and water. It can also result from nutritional impairment as a result of severe poverty in some areas of the world or a disease of the gastrointestinal tract impairing intake, digestion or absorption of food and producing a nutritional hypoproteinemia. Besides this, generalized edema can sometimes occur as a result of some drugs which has the capacity to retain sodium and water and can result in some, some conditions in which there is hormonal excess causing retention of sodium and water like pregnancy and some endocrine diseases. How do we approach a patient complaining of swelling of part or the whole body? Now first of all, we have to decide whether we are dealing with edema or not. The simple thing to do first is to find out whether the swelling pits on pressure or not. If it pits on pressure, then it is edema. If it doesn't, then it still can be edema, although it can be something else. Mild fluid retention might not be enough to produce pitting edema, although it can be felt by the patient as tightness or heaviness or the ring in the finger might be tight or the shoe might be tight. Obesity also might be claimed or thought by some people as edema. That's more commonly the case in women who try to deny that they are obese and think that what they have is edema which needs to be treated. Lymphedema is another cause of swelling that doesn't fit, usually because the interstitial fluid in this case is thick, although when it is severe it might fit. Mixed edema is another cause of swelling that doesn't fit and usually can be differentiated by the presence of other features of mixed edema. Localized edema affects a limited area of the body, usually asymmetrical, involving one arm, say, or one leg, and you might see an evidence of the local cause. Generalized edema caused by general retention of fluid usually affects a larger area of the body, although we have to remember that in the early stages, when it is mild, it might affect a small area, usually in the dependent parts, in the feet, in a mobile patient, or in the back or circular area in a patient who is bed-bound. It is usually symmetrical, although we have again to remember that occasionally it might be asymmetrical in a patient who is lying on one side for a long time. And in generalized edema, we, in most of the cases, we can find the cause of the edema in the form of heart disease or kidney disease or liver disease and so on. We should not forget that localized edema may coexist with generalized edema. A patient with nephrotic syndrome might develop deviant thrombosis in one leg, in which case this leg would be more swollen than the other leg. A patient with heart failure might develop hemiplegia, in which case the affected side, the paralyzed side, would be more swollen than the unaffected side. Investigations of a patient with edema obviously depend on the diagnosis you suspect from the clinical condition. Testing the urine for protein is usually simple and should be done to exclude renal disease. Assessing plasma proteins, plasma albumin mainly, is generally widely available and should be done to exclude renal disease, liver disease, malabsorption, malnutrition, and so on. Other investigations will depend on the suspected diagnosis. Few words about venous insufficiency edema, which is one of the commonest causes of edema. The blood moves from the lower part of the body to the heart against the gravity. 
and for this to occur two factors are needed the veins should have competent valves keeping the flow of blood moving in one direction towards the heart and the muscles should have enough tone and contraction to squeeze the veins to push the blood up in elderly people in many elderly people as a result of the passage of years the veins gradually dilate as a result of the blood pressure inside them and when they dilate the valves the cusp of the valves cannot close properly and the valves becomes incompetent this might be obvious when it is severe and can be seen as obvious varicose veins but sometimes when it is not so severe it's not very conspicuous and you have to look for it carefully to see some dilated veins the other factor which is the muscular contraction many people who lead a sedentary life and are sitting most of the time or standing without activity lack this important factor which keeps the blood flowing through the veins to the heart so these two factors might be sufficient to produce edema in many elderly men and women but we'll have to be careful not to attribute edema in an elderly man to venous insufficiency without excluding more serious causes like heart disease and kidney disease and so on I like to end up by saying a few words about resistant edema when you encounter a patient with edema who doesn't respond to treatment then several possibilities have to be looked into and corrected if possible the dose might be insufficient and has to be increased the patient might not be taking the drug as he should and should be advised to do so the patient might be vomiting or has diarrhea which impairs absorption and has to be this has to be treated in this respect patients with severe edema might not might not absorb drugs properly from the intestine as a result of edema of the intestine and in these patients drugs will do better if they are given parenterally on the other hand the drugs might be absorbed properly but doesn't reach the site of action at the renal nephron as a result of impaired glomerular filtration patients with impaired kidney function and reduced glomerular filtration usually need higher doses of diuretics patients might not respond to diuretics because they are not sticking to a low salt diet so the diuretic that the salt that they are losing is replaced by the salt that they are eating or the patient might be taking some drugs which causes salt and water retention like steroids or analgesic anti-inflammatory drugs and these should be dropped should be stopped if that is possible some patients with resistant edema have got a very intense state of hyperaldosteronism their suprarenal secretes a lot of aldosterone and in these patients it might help to add to the diuretics something which blocks the aldosterone system like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker or an anti-aldosterone like spironolactone patients with resistant edema usually need a combination of diuretics and when you combine diuretics it's advisable to use diuretics of different groups that act on different sides of the nephron so you should combine prosimide for example which acts on the loop of Henle with thiazide which acts on the distal tubule thank you